Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Join me today. He's an Emmy award-winning keynote speaker, author, professional drummer, entrepreneur, and the undercover millennial. It's Clint Pulver. How are you doing today, Clint? What's up, Alex? Happy to be on the show, man. Thank you. I'm excited to learn all about your Rise to the Challenge. First thing we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up. So I am from Heber City, Utah. Uh, a small little town, more cows than people at one point. And uh, man, I grew up uh, flying. I loved flying. Aviation was a big part of my life. I also grew, grew up playing the drums. I grew up wrestling. I played football. Uh, I love long walks to the fridge. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, that about sums it up for, for my young life. Were you someone at a young age that wanted to try everything instead of uh, sticking to one specific area? Yeah, a little bit. For me, it was, it was always, again, about what captured my heart. Like, what intrigued me? What did I really love or what fascinated me? And as a young kid, like, aviation was that, man. We lived close to the airport, and I'd watch crop dusters. Helicopters would come in. I don't know. I, I still remember my first air show when i saw like an f-16 like like some real power take off and, and it just shook the ground i was like oh my gosh i i was in i mean i saw top gun and all those you know all the cliche aviation things but man i was hooked there was something about it that i just loved and i had the opportunity when i graduated as a senior in high school i graduated with my private pilot certificate I went to flight school and got my wings I was so excited that was that was a big deal for me and then I graduated and I did a, a two-year study abroad I was gone and I, when I came home I was 20 I was 21 years old and 21 year, years young I guess I should say and I went in to renew my driver's license at the DMV Right, you've had this glorious experience, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a horrible place. And today it was this particular day, it was like Disneyland in the summertime. <laughs> Lines for days. I didn't have a fast pass. I waited for like I, I think it was like two and a half hours, seriously. Finally the lady, she calls my number. It's number two four two. And I walked up and I put my head in this little box. And I needed to read, you know, for the vision test, right? You've done this. And the screen went white, and all I could see were six black dots. That's it. Wow. And she was like, go ahead and read the letters. And I'm like, I, your machine is broken. <laughs> I was like, I'm pushing, and it's not working. She's like, you got to push harder. So I go over, click, 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 nothing. And I'm like, can I go to another machine? Because it's not working. And she lowered her glasses, and she was like, listen, kid, I've been here for like four and a half hours. I've literally seen like 57 people. Every one of them put their head in a black box and read the letters, read the letters. I go back for a fourth time. I put my head in, click. All I can see is six black dots. And she comes from around the counter. She pushes me out of the way. She puts her head in the black box and she reads out loud, C-K-G-E-L-F-W-Z-Y-N. Out loud. And then she looks at me and she says, can you read? <laughs> and I was like, yes. I'm like, ma'am, yes, I can read. And then she said, well, then, honey, I think you're blind. And I laughed for a minute and I was like, listen, lady, I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> like, we're having a conversation. I drove here today. And she looked at me and she took a big red stamp. She pushed it on my paperwork and she said, well, you're not driving home. And she denied my driving privileges. I was under house arrest at the DMV. <laughs> oh, God. I had to call my mom, Alex. I had to call my mom and I was like, mom, they're not letting me leave. And she's like, why? What are you talking about? I didn't pass the vision test. Long story short, I ended up at the Moran Eye Center at the University of Utah with the top leading authority in a rare degenerative eye disease known as keratoconus. And I had it really bad. That, that was the day I was told that I was losing my eyesight. It's the day I was told I was going blind. 
I am somebody for sure that believes in the power of moments. Like, I think that's what we remember. We don't remember days. We remember moments. And that was a moment that I'll never forget. And, and then, and then, you know, the doctor asked, he said, listen, (laughs) you have an eye disease and your eyes as a 21 year old kid are about as bad as an 87 year olds. And you have till age 31, maybe 32 until you'll go completely blind. And then he, and then he asked, you know, the question that every young person gets asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to fly, sir. I was like, nobody wants to fly more than me. And he got really serious and he said, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. Your eyes are too bad. He said, your condition, I'll see to it personally that you never end up in a cockpit ever. You can't. And then I was a young person who had my eye on the sky. And then I watched in a moment as the sky fell in all around me. And I don't think we really understand in our lives how important purpose is. Like something to really wrap your heart around until it's gone. Right? Some people say you don't really understand the water until the wells rise up. It's very true. And I went from having no direction and not knowing what to do when I looked at my future. All I saw was black, all darkness. To how do, how do I figure out how to live a life by design? How do I figure out how to live a life worth living? Because everybody wants to, you know, have a sense of happiness, I feel like. You know, even, even people that are really depressed or anxiety, anxious or they struggle with negative, negative thoughts or even suicidal thoughts. Everybody still wants to feel happy, right? Nobody wants to be sick with the flu all the time. Like who, 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 who is that? Who does that? Nobody, nobody feels that way. We all want to feel good. We all want to have a sense of purpose. We want to feel peace, happiness, and joy. And in this moment, as weird as it sounds, when aviation was stripped from my life, I didn't have that. It was really hard. It was really difficult. But I ended up writing a different story. And I learned really quickly that sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. Let me repeat that. Sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. And out of what I thought was a mess turned a beautiful message, uh, turned into a beautiful message that helped me write a better story, which I'm grateful for. During that time where you felt that things were getting taken away through this challenge that you were overcoming, was there someone that kind of kept you motivated or you were inspired by that kept you going and continuing to find something maybe new that you wanted to do? Yeah, there was lots of people. Um, I believe there's the spiritual types of angels, and I also believe in the physical types of angels. People like a good mom and a dad. People like good friends, mentors, a good counselor, a good uh, teacher, a great brother or a good sister, a grandpa or a grandma. These physical angels that in every sense of the word, they become angelic in our lives. They help connect us to our dreams. They help us to see more than we ever could on our own. When I was really little, before the aviation bug hit, I I had a hard time sitting still. I really, I still have a hard time sitting still. Like my, my right hand would just move like uncontrollably. I would just tap and tap and tap and tap. And then, and then my left hand would start to tap and tap. And it would happen again and again and again and again. And obviously everybody in the room is like, do it one more time and I'm going to rip your head off, <laughs> right? Like it gets annoying. And I got called the twitcher. A lot of the kids called me the tapper. And even the, the teachers were frustrated. But I, I, had, one, I had one teacher, Alex. And his name was Mr. Jensen. And he looked at me when I was tapping in class and he just said, he said, young man in the back. He said, yeah, you. He said, I wanna, I wanna see you after class. We're gonna have a conversation. And I'm thinking like as a young little kid, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am, I'm getting kicked out of school as a 10 year old. I just gotta be a world record. <laughs> All the other kids in the class are like, oh, Twitcher's gonna die. <laughs> like, oh. I'm so, I'm in so much trouble. The bell rings, everybody leaves. 
except for me and Mr. Jensen. He says, come here, come here, come here, sit down. We go to the back of the, the room and he said, listen, you tap a lot. <laughs> you tap in my class, you tap in everybody else's class. You're, you're the kid that's on the list. Like you, you just, you, everybody's, you know, you're kind of the problem, kid. He said, but I've watched you, though. He said, you'll take a pen, and you'll start, you'll start writing, you'll, you'll do your assignment, and then you'll tap with your left hand. He said, and then I, I watch, it's crazy. He said, you'll switch the pen, and you'll start writing with your left hand, and then you'll tap with your right hand. He's like, it's, it's, it's crazy to watch. He, he said, I think you're ambidextrous. And I was like, no, I'm Presbyterian. He said, no. <laughs> He said, no, 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 no. He said, that's not what it means. He said, no, no. <laughs> he said, he said, can you tap your head and rub your belly? And the kid's like, yes. I'm just like, yes, I can do it. And he's like, well, can you switch it? He said, then, then can, you, can you rub your head and then tap your belly? Switch it. And I was like, yeah, I can do it with, without thinking about it. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, I, I don't think you're a problem. I just think you're a drummer. Some people hear that and they're like, what's the difference between those two things? <laughs> but he leaned back in his chair. Remember when I said I talk, I talk about moments? Mm -hmm. Like uh, the power of a really great moment. And they shape our lives. Because in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leans back in his, in his desk. And he opens up the top drawer. And he reached inside. And he took out my very first pair of drumsticks. Oh, wow my very first pair. And he said, he said, Clint, listen, these are for you. I want you to take them. He said, but here's the deal. You got to promise me that you'll keep them in your hands as much as you can. And that was 22 years ago. And I can sit here today and I can tell you honestly, you know, 22 years ago, literally to this exact day, I have tried my best to keep my promise to Mr. Jensen. And for 22 years, I've had the opportunity to tour and record all over the world as a professional drummer. I've been on America's Got Talent. I've played with uh, Tim McGraw, Carrie Underwood. Um, I, I remember I, when I graduated high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, right? I couldn't fly anymore. So what do you do when you graduate high school and you have no idea what you want to do with your life? You go to college, right? Yeah. <laughs> I went to college. I had no clue what to do, but I graduated in 2012 with a bachelor's degree and zero college debt, zero. And that was from music scholarships, all because of music scholarships. And I don't say all that to go, oh, wow, good for you, Clint, or oh, what, a, what an amazing story. No, the reason I'm telling you that is because of one person, one person in my life who helped me see more than I ever could have on my own. How do we get through challenges and tough times? You find a Mr. Jensen. You find those people that you say, I like myself best because I'm with you. Yep. And you do whatever it takes to associate with those great and astonishing people that help you to see further. Right? Sir Isaac Newton, he always said that if I've ever seen further, in my life, it was because I was standing on the shoulders of giants that allowed me to see. Mr. Jensen was one of those giants. And I think when you're struggling, you got to find those great people. You got to find those people that you like yourself best when you're with them. You got to find those people that breathe life into you. They're the fountains, not the drains. And when you associate with people like that, they will help you to see what's really there. They will help you to see the opportunities, not the problems. And that's what we need in this life. I like that story, I think, because it shows that a lot of us out there maybe are missing that Mr. Jensen, or we have that person in our lives. And I know for me, I have a few of those people that no matter what situation I'm going through, I'm able to count on them to be there for me. And sometimes you feel that you had that person, but they don't come in clutch at that moment that you need them. And it just goes downhill from there. And I think you all, you talking about how you're still using what you promised him 
so many years ago, it shows how big of an impact he made in your life and how it's so important to you today. Yeah. And sometimes we have to ask for help. I think sometimes when we're having a really difficult time or we're in a really dark place, like sometimes the last thing that's on your mind is to ask for help because yep. you don't want to be judged. You don't want to be you know, dramatic. You don't want someone to know about your problem. You don't want to seem like a burden, but really, my goodness, how else do you expect to get out of it? And sometimes those trials are so hard. They're so difficult that there's no way you can do it on your own. There's no way. And I found that most of the time, most good humans, when you ask for help, they're there. They're there. And they love you more for it. And they're so glad that you did. And you create better connection. You create stronger connections. Uh, because that's what trials do. That's what adversity does. It always makes you stronger. Mm-hmm. It always makes you makes you a better person. You know, that, that's that's how we grow. You do difficult things, you grow through it, and you become stronger. And so don't be afraid to ask. I think that's an important aspect in challenges. Ask for help because most good people are willing to help you. You talked about the amazing accomplishments and opportunities you were given with being a professional drummer. How did you know that was the path that you wanted to take? You know, and it, it never really actually turned out to be the path I, I actually took. I took it for a time. Um, it's still a big part of my life. I still drum when I perform on stage and when I go and speak and do all of that. Like, it's a major aspect of my life. But I think there's, there's, there's something to be said with, again, doing what pulls on your heartstrings. Like, do what you love, gosh darn it. I, I, Mark Twain, I don't know if Mark Twain ever said this, but the, he gets attributed this saying all the time. It's a little cliche, a little cheesy, but I like it. He says that there's two important days in a person's life. There's the day you're born and then the day you figure out why. And I usually don't say this. I probably shouldn't say this, Alex, but I'm going to say it. Uh, Out of 80 million sperms, you're the one that won. (laughs) (laughs) Like you're the one that won. Do you remember? You remember the day of the big race and you were like, let's go. And you won. And like 80 million of them, you won. (laughs) And I think sometimes we live this life of default. We live this life of the mundane, the the life of existing versus the life of living. Two important days, the day you were born and then the day you figure out why. And I don't care what you do on this earth. None of us are getting out of this life alive. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're not getting out alive. Nobody is. We all will eventually die. And when we get to that moment, whenever it is, I believe we'll be surrounded by two things. We'll be surrounded by the woulda, shoulda, couldas, or we'll be surrounded by the do it, did it, done it. And, you know, what are you doing to really live? What are you doing to really, I don't know, take advantage of the gift that you've been given, right? Figuring out what it is that you were put here to do. I call it the three P's. If you can find passion in what you do, could you imagine like doing what you actually love to do most of the time? That would be amazing. Right? Like I guarantee you do this podcast partly because you love it. Yep. It fills up your soul. It's, it's something that pulls on your heartstrings. But imagine too, second, if you could do that thing that you love, but you could combine it with the ability to provide for yourself. Or you could maybe make some money doing it, right? Because if you want to live as a responsible human being, life costs some money. (laughs) It does. It's expensive, like insurance and a car and gas and taxes. Oh, my gosh. And a mortgage. You'll learn about this word called a mortgage. Everybody said that when I was growing up. It's true. It's, it's It's an expensive word. So that's part of it, right? The third part is purpose. Because really, a fulfilling life, in my opinion, is not just doing what you love all the time. It's not just doing what what fulfills you and makes you feel great. So much of real joy and real significance comes from what you do for others. It's how you better the world. I've always said that it is not about being the best in the world. Nobody gives a rip about that. 
what they care about is how you're being the best for the world. It's not about being the best in the world. It's about being the best for the world. And that's the third P, is purpose. So what if you could find a job that allowed you to do something bigger than yourself? Passion, provide, and purpose. What a concept. Because most people don't have that in what we call work. They don't have that in their job. And then they wonder why they're stressed out of their mind. Then they wonder why they hit the midlife crisis. And they hit that wall going, what's it all for? And what have I done with my life? And, and we find ourselves in a dark space, in a place of loneliness, in a place of regret, in a place of doubt. And I think we need less of that in the world. And the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing about all of this is you can choose it. You can choose to design it. You can choose to create it. No matter how dark the situation is, you can choose to change it. I, I believe that God can't steer a parked car. That's kind of not true. He could probably do whatever he wants. But, but there's a sense, there's a point in that. You got to take action. Be willing to design your life, not just live it by default. And in doing so, I think that's how we paint a beautiful picture. Stroke by stroke, little by little. And if you can follow your passion, you can figure out how to provide so that you're not homeless. <laughs> and third, you can serve somebody else in the process. Oh, man, I think you're living. There's a, there's a quote, really quick, a quote by Oscar Wilde. This is a gem. It's changed my life. And the quote says, to live is the rarest thing in the world. For most people merely exist, and that is all. It's by Oscar Wilde. To live. Could you imagine at the end of your days to be able to say, I really lived. I really lived. What a, what a privilege. My goodness. What, what a cool and wonderful thing to say. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people that just say, I existed. You know, I chased the money. I chased the likes on, on Facebook. I chased the fame. I love how, you know, you and I were talking before and you're like, I could care less about how many subscribers I have. All I care about is, is the impact I'm making. All I care about is I'm learning and being a better, becoming a better person myself. That's that's the that's the foundation of living. And and you found some of that, you know. And I think it's what we're all searching for. We just don't design it enough, and then we wonder why it doesn't happen. I think we should design more than we live by default. Live, don't just exist. I think that message goes key with. I think first with high school and it's how people are like, oh, I have to be the popular one or I have to be the top person. And it's kind of like, think about those people that said that, but look where the people who were like the underdogs are and they're making yes. a huge impact in this world. And then you have college and everyone wants to be the big person on campus. And yeah. Look where they're at. They're the ones struggling with grades and stuff. And I always viewed myself as I don't, and kind of like how we talked about earlier, I don't need to have that fame or that top person persona because I know the people that I want to be associated with or around me know who the real Alex is. And mm -hmm. they're going to see what he's going to do in life. And I look at some of these people now and friends that are still in college and they're struggling with that. They're, they don't know how to live. And I think I did an episode a, a while ago about regret and not regretting any decisions that you make. If you think that you want to go do something, an activity, go do it because you're going to be happier that you actually did it instead of when you're getting older and you're not able to do that anymore. Yeah. Mark Twain said 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do yep. than by the things that you did do. And here, here's what's crazy. There's a difference. I think it's important to, to talk about. Alex, have you ever seen that, that show? Okay. Okay, have you, have you seen the, uh, the movie Sandlot? Yes, love it. Great movie. You got these little punk kids, and they hit the ball over the fence, signed by Babe Ruth. Yep. And you got the dog, the big, the beast. It's going to rip their face off. Do you remember Benny? Yes. 
Yeah. Benny has that that the dream. He has this dream because he's they're in the pickle and they got to figure out how to get out of it. Who appears to Benny in the dream? Do you re- do you remember? It's been so long since I've seen it. I'd probably say the wrong name thinking about it. It, it was Babe Ruth. I should have just guessed that. <laughs> now, remember, remember Babe Ruth comes walking through the closet and he, and it's like, "Oh my gosh, there's Babe Ruth." And he he's like, "You're in this pickle and he's he kind of tells him how to get out of this situation." The departing words, though, that the babe says to Benny. He says, remember, heroes get remembered, but legends never die. And every time, every time I hear that, Alex, I go, "Uh, heroes get remembered, but Mr. Jensen's never die. Yep. Watch this. Check this out. This is cool. Uh, Alex, could you tell me who the last three NFL MVPs were? No, I couldn't tell you. What about, okay, here's another one. I probably would say I could name people, but I couldn't tell you who, well, I'm going to try. So this last Super Bowl, Buccaneers won. So it had been Tom Brady or Rob Gronkowski. The year before was the Kansas City Chiefs, because I lived in Missouri, and I'm going to say it has to be Patrick Mahomes. I could, I don't even know who won three seasons ago. Pretty close, pretty good. What about, uh, what about, um, what about the last two? Let's even go two on this one. What about the last two Academy Award winners for Best Actor? I don't even watch those. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what about the, who, who, who are the last two Miss Americas? Don't watch that. Uh, come on, Alex. Okay. You get my point. They are some of the most successful or what we would deem popular, prestigious people in the world. They have millions of followers. They make lots of money, whatever you want to call it. Most most people have no idea who they are. Nope. No clue. But watch this. Alex, if I were to ask you to tell me the name of the teacher who's made the biggest difference in your life, could you tell me the name? Yeah. Oh, you want me to say the name? Yeah, who is it? Mrs. Reeves. Mrs. Reeves. Uh, 11th and 12th grade algebra teacher in high school. There you go. Right? Like, we, we instantly remember those people. Why? Because it's the difference between success and significance. It's not, it's not about being the best in the world. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. They didn't have an impact on my life. Yeah. But it's about being the best for the world. You remember her because she remembered you. You remember her because she was the person that got to the part about you. She was a Mr. Jensen. I guarantee it. She communicated your worth. She also communicated your potential. I don't even know her. I don't even know the story. But I know that you remember her because she lived a life of significance. That is how you live, not just exist. I love that, that, that segment we just had. I mean, that it's just so true. Like everything you just said is so true because the people that played the big impact on your life, you'll remember them for so long. And there's moments that you have those moments and they will come into your mind. You're like, I kind of went through this again. That's just, I, that's something I would take for ever in from this interview. Plus that and many other things, but that's just, it's so true. I mean, it's, it's, you hear it from someone else's point of view and you're like, I kind of do that already. But when they say it, you're like, I am doing the right thing when I'm doing it. It's yeah. just you have to hear it out loud. Yeah, and sometimes it's so easy to, to, to get swayed, right? We can get caught up in the likes. You can get caught up in the, in the, the followers. You can get caught up in the looks or what other people think. But really, at the end of the day, again, you're going to be surrounded by the, the do it, did it, done it, or the what a shit it is. And why not be surrounded by the, yeah, I made an impact. Yeah, I lived significantly. I didn't just exist. I really lived. I was the best for the world, not just the best in the world. As a professional drummer, what has been the greatest opportunity or accomplishment you've had with that? 
honestly, it's the little moments that I have because I don't tour anymore. I'm, I'm not on like big stages performing with artists and doing rock concerts anymore. I, I perform on stages as a professional speaker and I share my research and I wrote a book and I talk about that. I'm trying to be the best for the world. And honestly, the greatest moments in my life is when, you know, I speak to schools a lot and I speak to young people. And when little kids come up and they say, I'm you, I'm the kid that can't sit still. I'm the kid that always gets teased. Or I'm the kid that feels like he's a problem. And I have a moment for, for a drummer. Our greatest honor is to be able to give somebody our drumsticks. Like giving your sticks to another person in the drumming world is a sign of friendship. It's a sign of respect. And for a person whose life was literally changed with a pair of drumsticks, the greatest moments as a musician is when I've had the opportunity to give drumsticks to other kids, to other people. I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm literally emotionally, metaphorically, spiritually, I'm trying to give drumsticks to people. I'm trying to turn on the light bulb. I'm trying to go, you know, I'm trying to create an environment where they go, I see differently now. I see myself differently now. I see the world a little bit differently now because of what you gave me. And if I can be a Mr. Jensen for other people, then mission accomplished. As a keynote speaker, what's that mission you're wanting to tell your audience or the people that are listening to you speak? It depends on who I'm speaking to. Sometimes I'm speaking to elementary kids. Sometimes I'm speaking to high school seniors. Sometimes I'm speaking to college kids. Sometimes I'm speaking to business, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And it's all their C-level top executives. It just depends. And there's a different message for every audience. I think that's what I love most about my, my industry is every keynote is the Super Bowl to me. Like this moment right now for you and I, this is the Super Bowl for me. Like I'm giving you everything I've got. I'm trying to, to you know, make sure that we do a good job and that you walk away from this and you're like, man, that was worth my time. And that your listeners walk away from this saying, man, that was, that was really good. He got to the part about me. That's what I try to do as a, as a professional speaker. It's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not about me playing the drums. It's not about the applause. It's about me getting to the part about you as an audience member so that I can open up the window for influence. So I can, I can, I can help you. I can, I, can, I can hopefully help write a better story. That, that's why a speaker is brought in. We are brought in to solve a problem. We're brought in to spark ideas. And so if I'm not doing that on stage, then I'm not doing my job. And so for me, every message is different. Even though it's the Super Bowl every time, every objective is different. Some schools struggle with bullying. Or maybe I just did a school last week and they lost two kids to suicide. My message is going to be different for them than it is for another school. And that's what keeps it fresh. That's the beautiful thing about speaking and no no two keynotes are alike for me and that's why i like to speak to kids and i also like to speak to adults i like to speak to educators i love to speak to parents because it's all different and it keeps it fresh even though the ideas are sometimes the same no two keynotes are alike you're my you're my seventh podcast today wow. Alex, did you know that? i've done seven you're, you're number seven every podcast has been different We've talked about different things on every show. But again, every show is the Super Bowl. And it's my job to get to the part about you. I think that's what makes a keynote speaker special is you're not hearing the same story multiple times. Like you can go to one place and someone there may have been at a different place hearing you talk, but they're going to notice that there's something different, most likely. And I think that's what's special about even these shows with guests. It's they bring, you can always get, find a way to get something new from them. Would you say when you bring your drums on stage for mm -hmm. your speaking gigs, it differentiates yourselves from another keynote speaker where your guests see that and they're like, ooh, this is going to be fun or this is going to be different that I've never seen before? 
Yeah, 100%. And, and so there's the, there's the inspirational, motivational, uh, influential side of speaking. Then there's the business side of speaking, marketing, branding, differentiation, uh, making something uh, disruptive, iconic, unique. And that's where the drums really pay a big factor into why somebody would book me as a speaker versus somebody else. He's not just someone who gets on stage and, and talks. He's actually an experience. And like the Mr. Jensen story, for example, I tell that story third person and they have no idea that I'm the kid in the story. And then we reveal the drums on stage and then they go, oh my gosh, he's the kid. Oh my God. Like, and he's, he's a drummer. And then I sit down and we rock the house and it gives the audience members the chance to see what influence looks like, not just listen to what influence can be. And then we also do like a live drum line experience where all of a sudden everybody gets drumsticks and everybody's got buckets and we create this live experience where they actually get to participate. We're all, we all become drummers and it's all about how do we create harmony? How do we create teamwork? How do we listen better? How do we create an inclusive environment? How do we lift and lean on each other? Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's not just a keynote. It's an experience. How did you know that you wanted to write a book to continue telling a story in a way? So much of my business that I've created as a professional speaker has been built upon listening to other people. I listen. I listen to the clients. I listen to the customers. Listen to the audience. When somebody comes up and they're like, oh, Glenn, you were great. That was so cool. Oh, what a great speech. Instead of saying, oh, thanks a lot. And that feels really good. Instead of saying that, I always like to ask, what did you learn? What stood out? What was, what was the one thing from the speech that, that meant the most to you? And I listen to that. And I see if there's a trend. If they, you know, if I, I can talk to five kids and all five kids say the same thing, mm, there, there's something there. And focus on that. I think that's how you create a good business. You, you got to create a product that people will consume. And if it doesn't solve a problem, if it's not something that people are catching or they're not listening to or they're not wanting in life, then yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to sell. And so I, I've just really, really tried to listen. And that's why I wrote a book. Because I would get off stage and people would be like, well, how do I, how do I find more? Uh, do you have a book? You know, is there something I can read? Is it, and I, I didn't have anything. So after so many times and years of people asking for that, I said, okay, it's, it's time to start that process. And it's such a hard, I will never do it again. <laughs> I'll never do it again, ever. I did it, it's done, checked off, never again. Not That's even if he becomes the number one New York Times bestseller, you're not going to try again for number two? I don't know. That's what everyone's like, oh, yeah, you say that, you say that, you'll do it again. No, I don't think I will. I, I, it's here's the thing to write a really good book and to do it really well it is the most painful <laughs> grueling experience I've ever had as a human being um I was just I was just writing a, a little blog about it you know the dark gritty lonely stressful fatigued life of an author behind the curtain oh it's not pretty it's not a pretty thing, but I'm really grateful that I did it. You know, it's one of those things that I say, I'll never do it again, but I'm really grateful that I did. And there's a lot of, I think, important lessons in that, in life, right? There's a lot of things that we don't want to do, but it's uh, sometimes the thing that we need to do. And in the end of it, we're really grateful that we did it. Don't be afraid of hard things because on the other side is, other, on the other side of that is, usually something pretty, pretty significant. Well, a hard challenge for me would be even starting to write a book, but I ain't going to even try to mess with that. I'm like, I would change that book idea and make it into like a movie or a video, something completely different. That's more my style. Something we talked about earlier as we finish up this conversation, do you feel that you have found your purpose or do you wish that you changed the direction you have gone on 
throughout your career? No. No. With, without a shadow of doubt. And it's something I'm very grateful that I can say. That the day I quit my job, when I left, because I graduated college, I went into the medical field. I couldn't fly anymore. Kind of chased the money. I chased the benefits, chased the salary. And I proposed those three Ps to two, two of my buddies. I said, couldn't, wouldn't it be crazy if you found a job that allowed you to do what you love, played to your passions, you could provide and contributed to your purpose. And both my friends were like, I don't think it exists. And two weeks after that, I quit my job. And I did it to live, not just exist. I quit my job to chase the three Ps. And without a doubt, I can sit here today and tell you the day I quit my job was the day I started living. And every day I have had the blessing and the privilege. Doesn't mean it's always been easy. Doesn't mean it's been a breeze, right? <laughs> it's the entrepreneur life. We work 80 hours a week so we don't have to work 40. <laughs> yep. But I have lived and I'm continuing to live because I do what I love. I'm also able to provide in a way that's sufficient for my family. And three, I'm contributing to something bigger than myself. And yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful I can say that. So what does the future look like for you personally and professionally? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years? Well, so much of my life is, is, is uh, being a daddy and being a good husband. Uh, I have uh, a beautiful wife and two gorgeous, wonderful little baby girls that are my whole world. Um, and so that ultimately is the, the biggest priority right now. Um, second is uh, we're, we're in book launch season right now. So we're getting ready for the launch of the book, which comes out April 13th everywhere. Uh, we titled the book, I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations Their People Never Want to Leave. And it's all focused around my undercover research as the undercover millennial and how not just good leaders, but good parents and good friends, good teachers. How do you create classrooms and friendships and environments where people like themselves best because of you? And so we're, 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 we're diving into that a ton right now. And that's going to be a big part of my life for the future and talking about the book, talking about the research. And uh, we're coming out with a, a brand new masterclass, which is uh, a video series that we're creating that breaks down the book and all of the research. So that's been a lot of fun. That's a big future event. Um, there's lots to look forward to, but there's also a lot in our business right now and in my personal life that I'm just, I don't want to say content with, but I'm at peace with. Like it's, I'm really happy with where we're at. I'm really at a good spot where we've worked really hard to get to this place. And where we are is, is beautiful. We've worked really hard for it. And so, yeah, the best is yet to come. Based on your journey and experience, for someone that's listening to this interview, what tips or advice would you give someone to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals, and rise to the challenge? Take a breath. <laughs> take a breath. Sit back. Take a breath. And know that you don't have to boil the ocean. Stop trying to boil the ocean. <laughs> I, would, I would tell that person that I, I would quote Da Vinci when Da Vinci says that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I think in our lives, sometimes we're so good at the hustle and bustle. We got a million things going on. You got, you got a schedule blocked out. You got work. You got a family. You, you got dinner you got to make. You got you to run the kids to this sports event. You got this thing you're worried about. You got this date that you're going on. You got this assignment that you got to fill out. I mean, whatever it is. Like, we are so busy. And I think we're really good at creating a to-do list. Alex, do you like a to-do list? Are you a, like a list guy? Yep. Yeah. Like, we get that little shot of the, you know, those endorphin hits. Oh, every time we check it off, you're like, oh, I'm feeling good today. Killing it. In my research, I have found that good leaders know what they need to do. But the great leaders knew what they needed to stop doing. So instead of writing a to-do list, I would recommend everybody listening to this, start writing a to-don't list. 
What are the things that you can stop doing that will allow you to become more? It's not always about what we do. It's sometimes the things that we stop that make us the most significant person. What can you quit doing? When the, when the astronauts went up to space, they started using ballpoint pens because they needed to write out all the equations. And they found out one of the first lessons they learned in space is that a ballpoint pen won't work while you're in space. The gravity, like, for the like, it won't write. And so they, they fire back to NASA, and they're like, we got an issue. We can't write in space. We have no idea. The ballpoint pen's not working. So all of the NASA engineers, everybody, they spent thousands and thousands of dollars designing and creating a pen that could write in space. But what do you think they did until they could figure out the pen? They just had to remember it all. They used a pencil. Wow. <laughs> like a trick question. <laughs> like some of these people got to remember these equations. I know, right? Right? Yeah, there is. There is. There's a sense that you got to remember. But sometimes you just got to use a pencil. <laughs> the point is, is sometimes we just overcomplicate things. And, and it is simplicity that is the ultimate sophistication. Break out the to-don't list. Start creating boundaries. What are the things that you can stop doing? You know, like in, 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 in marriage, right? Like, what, what, like in a relationship, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing we all do? You wake up, you grab your phone, you, you look at your emails, you check out what you got, what happened last night on Instagram, what's going on on Facebook. Or do you write a to-don't list? And when you wake up, you go, I'm not grabbing the phone. Instead, I'm going to turn over to the person next to me and tell them how much I love them. And I'm going to just connect for a minute. I'm going to go and I'm going to give myself 15 minutes of exercise instead of 15 minutes of scrolling. I I've always said this, marriage is grand, but divorce is about 100 grand. <laughs> so <laughs> I would recommend that you start creating a to-don't list. What are the things that you can stop doing that will allow you more time to connect? Keep it simple. I like those. I mean, each, each tip and advice, I think everyone can utilize today. And no matter what situation they're going through, I think we can all learn more about ourselves and what we go through just by writing it down or thinking about it, taking the breath and stuff. Cause I know I have those days where I go wake up, go to work, get home. Now I'm doing the podcast and then I'm in at 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, did I even have time for myself? And I've had to tell myself, okay, you're not doing anything on this day. And it's the most rewarding thing in the world. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Stop playing defense and do a little offense so you can score. Sometimes we like we sit there in life and we just let the emails come in and we let the schedule dictate our lives. And, and, and we go on the phone and all of a sudden we've like wasted three hours because we just mindlessly scrolled through 1,600 YouTube videos. <laughs> like play some defense, right? And so that, that allows you to score more. That, you know, how, how do we expect to win in life when we're so busy just trying to block out the, the craziness of a schedule yep. of our lives? Put up the boundaries. Well, Clint, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You've inspired so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you. It's been an honor. I really appreciate it. Good luck to you.